Good afternoon. This afternoon is December 7th, 1998, December 7th being the Memorial for Pearl Harbor Day. In continuing our Veterans Oral History Project, we're here at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts. This afternoon we have the pleasure of in interviewing Anthony Tony Quajo. Good afternoon, Mr. Quajo. How do you do? How are you? Very well, thank you. Could you give us your current address? In Sherborne. And you're married? Yes. And your wife's name? June. And how long have you been married to June? Of, of 48 years. And do you mind my asking you your age? Oh, I'm 75. 75. And you do have children, I understand? Yes. How many? Three. Three children? Mm -hmm. And grandchildren? I have two. Two grandchildren. Where were you born? I was born in Portugal. You were born in Portugal? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, I came with my mother here when I was eight months old. My father was already here. And in what? Framing, in Framingham, I'm sorry. In Framingham. And mm -hmm. what brought your father to Framingham? Well, they'd been here before. And my older brother was born here. And what brought them here originally, of course, was a poverty uh, over in Portugal. And they'd, they'd gone back for a couple of years. I was born there. And then we came again in 1923. And my mother and I came back in 1923. And what type of business was your dad in? Uh, he was a, he worked in, the, in a foundry, in the Framingham foundries, mm -hmm. as a laborer. Mm -hmm. And did you grow up in Framingham? Yes, I did. What was it like growing up in Framingham in the 20s? I, uh, the 20s, uh, I can just barely remember, really, you know. The what about in your childhood? Kind of, well, of course, it was a very relatively small town. I think there were about 60,000 at that time. Uh, I knew everyone in my neighborhood. Uh, I guess we were poor, but I didn't realize it at the time. What part of Framingham were you living in? Uh, Beaver Street, Beaver Court, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I, I don't want to assume, but there were not a lot of apartment buildings there no. either. No, there weren't. Houses? Uh, yes, individual houses. Mm -hmm. uh, quite a few were two-family houses. And was mm -hmm. it a close community? Yes, yes. Uh, at, uh, in Beaver Court, where I lived, it was very close. There were. Or four, three or four houses, and we were very, very close, very, very friendly group. And your, your mom and your dad moved here from their own country. Your, your brother, was he your only sibling? Yes. And how old was he when you, when you moved here? You uh, said he was already He here. was two years older than I am, mm -hmm. almost exactly. So he was uh, going on for, uh, two or three. <laughs> And you went to the Framingham schools? Yes. What made you decide, or were you drafted into the military? What made you decide to join? Uh, well, there were two things. One, uh, all my friends were, were in. And also, I was subject to the draft. I knew I would be drafted anyway. And I had, I felt the opportunity to, to go in with the, they had a program called the uh, ASTP. I think it was the Armed Services Training Program, and uh, I, um, I enlisted, but I knew I was going to be drafted anyway, and mm -hmm. all my friends were in, my girlfriend was encouraging me to join, to, to enlist. Was this after high school? Yes. And how old were you when you went in the service? Twenty. Were you working at that time, or were you right out of high school? Uh, I had gone to Bentley's School of Accounting, it was a two-year course, and I would graduated from there, and I was working. Uh, as an accountant or in an accounting office? Yes, uh -huh. as an accountant in Framingham. Were you able to enter the service with any of your friends? You did mention some were already in. Yes, but no, I didn't go in with anyone, no. So knowing that you were going to be drafted, you entered. And what was, how many years commitment was that going to be for you? It was just, I don't know, it was open. It was open. Uh -huh. And did you enter through the Army? Yes. Tell us about that. You enlisted, and when were you called up? What month of the year was it? Uh, uh, actually, it was. Uh, I went in on November first, nineteen forty-three. And where did you do your basic training? At Fort Benning, Georgia. Was this your first time down in the southern states? Uh, yes, it was. Uh -huh. Do you remember anything about it that sort of struck you as being different from what you were raised in? 
No, uh, except that uh, uh, of the boys I was in the service with were from all parts of the country, and especially the South, it seems like there were quite a few from the South. Did I'm, you develop any kind of close friendships with your tra other trainees? I, I was friendly with two or three, but uh, after I left that group, no, I, I didn't keep in contact with any of them. And how long was your basic training? Do you remember? Uh, wait a sec. I think it was three months. You know, three months. Yeah. During that basic training, did you find that there were any specialties that you kind of rose to the top about? So. No, it was pretty basic training. Mm -hmm. you know? And then after Fort Benning, where did you go? Uh, then uh, the ASTP program folded. But even before that, uh, I was told I couldn't be in it because I hadn't taken any algebra in high school. And uh, I was sent to uh, the 69th Infantry Division in Camp Shelby, Mississippi. Uh, what was it like at Camp Shelby? Camp Shelby was pretty pretty raw, you know, whereas uh, for, um, in Georgia... Uh, Fort, Fort Benning? Fort Benning, yeah. It was a modern-looking uh, installation with brick buildings. Camp Shelby, as I recall, it was like tar shacks. There was no barracks, but the outside were all tar paper. And it was, um, you know, hot and humid. Even, uh, I went there, I think it was in, in March, uh, and it was uh, pretty hot and humid even then. So was that the, the, the humidity and the weather, the change in weather, it changed in what you were used to? Was, yeah. was that something that you had to learn to cope with each day? Yes, but, but really I wasn't there very long because I was on my way overseas already, really. And did you know that when you were going to Camp Shelby? No, I didn't. So I, once you arrived there, how did you find out that you'd be going overseas? Well, it was an infantry uh, division, and uh, I don't recall, I really don't, except uh, that uh, soon, practically as soon as I got there, we did a little, tra a little training, and then they sent me home on, on, on furlough, and I just knew that after that furlough I was going to be on my way overseas, you know. Uh, so when you came home, you, did you come home to Framingham? Yes. By train? Uh, and, uh, uh, I think so, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, I think Do you so. remember coming home and what it was like to, to see your family knowing that you were going to go off to war? Well, I don't remember too much about that, but I'll tell you, a little later on, I went home again before I, I was able to go home. I'll tell you about that. That's a little bit interesting. Uh, well, well, okay, sh shall I continue on? Sure, uh, okay. go right ahead. Well, uh, uh, because then at, at uh, Camp Shelby, I can't remember how it came about, but we were told that we were going as replacements. Uh, although the, the war in Europe, uh, we hadn't landed on in Europe yet, but I knew, we knew we were going over to Europe someplace. And um, I'm sorry, let me see. I so you went on furlough once, but then you said you were going to be able to come home yes, again. Yes, yes. Tell, tell us about y that. Yeah. So then, like I said, they, they told us that we were going as replacements. And, uh, and we came by train again, uh, and at that time we we were told we were going, but we went to a Fort Meade, Maryland, and I think that was called a port of embarkation. I don't know why, because it wasn't a port of embarkation to, to any place. And but embark the, embarkation meaning basically checking out of the states and maybe going I, overseas. I, I guess, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. because uh, there was some processing done there, but I, I don't know just what. But then, I think we were there about a week, and incidentally, I was able to go for a week, uh, for a day, uh, to see my, my brother was living in, uh, in Maryland, in Baltimore, and I was able to get out one day to see him. And, now, your brother uh, was a few years older than you? Two years old. Did he join the service at all? No, he didn't. Mm -hmm. No, he worked with uh, uh, Martin Marietta, and, uh, and then with the predecessor to NASA. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, we were Ford Meade about a week, and then we were told again we were um, going overseas. And we went by train to, uh, we didn't know where we were going, but we went to Fort Miles Standish right here in, uh, in Massachusetts. 
which now, is now where is Fort was Fort Miles Standish? Was it's it? it's uh, on the Cape, Plymouth but, but area. It's on this side of the Cape, in the Plymouth area. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So we were there. Now that, to my mind, would be a port of embarkation or Boston because we left from Boston. Um, but we were there a few days, and we didn't do much of anything because we were just waiting for, I guess, for room on a ship to go overseas. And uh, but they let us. They gave us some time off. Uh, so I got excused and I found my way to Framingham to see my mother and father and my girlfriend. And, uh, and then I went, that night I went back to camp again. Each, each time I'd thumb my way. In those days, we would thumb quite a bit. That's why I almost didn't remember about the trains, but, uh, because we did thumb rides quite a bit. And thumbing is something you don't see nowadays. Do you no. want to explain what that is in case people doing research seeing this tape have no idea what well, you're talking we're, about? We were just looking for a ride, for anyone to pick us up and give us a ride. And in those days, uh, people with a uh, uniform on were picked up very easily. And, I and don't you would literally stick your thumb out, yes. right, to uh -huh. try to see if someone would pick you uh -huh. up. Yeah. Those yeah. were in the safe days, They were, they? yes. Uh, yes. Now I wouldn't think of picking anyone up, right. but in those days uh, we did. Uh -huh. yeah. So uh, I was able to get home maybe three, four, five times from Mount Standish to Framingham and, and then back again. You know? Now you mentioned during this time that um, you knew that you were going to be drafted and your friends had gone in and your girlfriend was also pushing you to join. Um, yes. Did you maintain a relationship with her throughout your war experiences? Uh, just before, uh, about April of 45, I got a Dear John letter. Oh dear. <laughs> we'll talk more about that <laughs> in, in, when we come up to the 1945 time. So you were at Fort Miles Standish for a while and then you disembarked through, through Boston. Yeah, but I can tell you one little story there. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, 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 after I'd gone to Framingham, you know, about three days, and then we were told we were, we were confined to quarters. We couldn't get out of there, so we knew we were leaving. And uh, so that morning, I think it was the, the 5th of June, uh, we loaded on the train early in the morning and didn't know where we were going. And the train kept clunking away. And pretty soon I recognized some places as uh, approaching Framingham. And down around if I came, didn't go right by through Sherbin, Framingham, and right by my backyard in Framingham. Yeah, I looked, you know, my, my house was there, my neighbor's dog, Duke was there. That was the only person I saw. Mm -hmm. Then the train went to Framingham, uh, and there it um, it stopped, and it changed tracks, and it, it, uh, it stopped right in front of a it used to be an old A and P supermarket there, and I used to work in that supermarket when I was in high school, and uh, there was a uh, a girl, a woman, uh, that worked in the A and P, working uh, outside. Uh, she was the bakery girl. She was breaking down boxes. And um, she lives in Natick right now, by the way. And Do you want to mention who she is? Yeah, uh, her name was her her maiden name was uh, Ann Jordan. It's, it's Ann Sebastian now, and they, they do live in Natick. I've, I've never seen them since. Then. But anyway, the train stopped, and my window was right where she was, and I got to the window and I was waving like crazy, but she never saw me. <laughs> That's so funny. That yeah. was so close. Uh -huh, yeah. Mm. So from there, the train w went into Boston, and people were through it windows waving, you know, and so forth. And we went to the Army base in Boston. And that was, again, that was the 5th of, of June, 1944. And then the next morning, uh, I guess I was in the, the cot inside, and I heard uh, somebody had a radio on, and I heard something about France and uh, Normandy and American troops, and we found out that it, that it was D-Day. The, the, uh, the, um, American troops had landed, and, and British troops also uh, in Normandy. So having learned prior to going over that they had landed on Normandy shores, did you also hear about some of the, the loss of life, or did you just hear basic information? Uh, I think it was the most basic information, although as I, and the invasion was only a few hours old then, but as I remember it, it was that we were making Progress. The American troops were making tro progress, and they were they had established a foothold, mm -hmm. and uh, that's uh, that's about what I remember of it. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing, though, know, up until then, at, at that time, until then, we thought we were going to England. When we heard that, we didn't know how this thing worked, but we thought we'd go right to France. 
And as it was, what did you do? Were you put on a ship? Yes. Uh, do you yeah. remember the name of the ship? Well, that was, yeah, the uh, SS America. Mm -hmm. It was a converted uh, um, luxury ship, I guess. Luxury liner. Luxury mm -hmm. liner. There used to be the SS Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And did you go into England from yes. the yeah. U.S.? Yes, we went into Southampton. Do you remember what it was like on your trip over? And was this a, your first time on a boat, on yes. a ship? Yes, to both questions. Huh? What was it like for you? Other than the fact that it was going to war, it was very pleasant. I really enjoyed it, yeah. Um, of course, the ship was very crowded. I don't know how many people were in there. And um, most of the people stayed inside. But we were jammed in, like sardines, you know. The, I don't know how many uh, bunks there were, you know. So I spent most of my time, other than the first day, I spent most of my time outside, night and day. But uh, in, inside, there was, was smoke filled. There was a crap game going on almost all the time in the, uh, in the uh, latrine. Meaning cards or uh, yeah, Both, dice. cards and dice, uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So or, they were or, allowed to smoke in the sh inside. inside the ship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Um, and that was it. It, would took, it only took five days. As soon as the uh, ship got outside of Boston Harbor, and that was kind of traumatic also because uh, I used to go to Nantasket on, the, on those little boats, and we went, started out the same route, you know, just kind of, you know, brought back memories. So did, did you sense, looking back, that you were a bit emotional about leaving the U.S.? Very much. Were you frightened or were you ready for adventure for this war that you were going yeah, to be a I, part of? I don't of? remember being frightened, honestly, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, uh, I wasn't looking forward to it, I'm sure, you know, but uh, that's about, about all I remember by that. So after five days at sea, um, which you seemed to go through okay, you yeah. landed in Southampton? Uh-huh, yeah. Oh, as soon as we left Boston Harbor, the ship began zigzag, uh, zigzag course, and we were told that uh, uh, it, uh, it could outrun any uh, German submarines and, and zigzagging. They wouldn't get a chance to, to aim. And, and we've heard this from a number of veterans, that when they were on the ships, a number of them did zigzag so that it would be difficult for the submarine to focus in on mm -hmm. a hit, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. And did you have smooth sailing? Yes. Mm -hmm. it, it was in June. It was smooth. Mm -hmm. yeah. The only thing toward thing, uh, there were, I think twice when the, uh, of course the ship was blacked out, you know, and I think twice the word came around that they'd sighted a sub, but if they did, uh, I never saw or heard anything about it. I think it's probably just a rumor. So blacked out meaning d during the evening there were no lights? Right. Uh -huh. And would that also mean, and I don't know what type of music or anything you could listen to, or could you at that point in time? I don't remember any music. Okay. Uh, so no radios or? Uh, well, as I said, the, the first day while we were still in the harbor, I heard that radio announcing the invasion, uh, and that's all I remember about. Mm -hmm. I don't remember any radios or music. Mm -hmm. So once you got off the ship, what was your next step? Okay. Um, and again, that was in Southampton. I remember a, a people, especially children, gathering at the dock, and they were begging, or asking for candy, and for anything. And we throw candy uh, um, down to them, um, and believe it or not, we were everyone gathered at the side of the boat that would face the um, the dock, to the point where I guess the, the ship was tipping a little bit, and so they made us get away from the uh, from the edge. And then from there we went on to our uh, onto the, uh, the English boats. Uh, I'm sorry, trains, and uh, we were a little bit. We thought they were a little bit comical. They were small. They seemed small, old compared to our ships, and we kind of belittled it a little bit. Then the only other thing I remember is that uh, on the uh, trains was that uh, again when, when we stopped, uh, I guess we were there some towns or something, and the, the kids would gather again begging for candy, and we throw candy uh, at them. Did they treat you as heroes? Do you remember? Then they were glad to see us. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh -huh. Were you able to talk to any of the? people in the different townships that you would? No. 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 Mm -hmm. And what was it like over there, weather-wise, in June and July? Uh, it, uh, well, I was there about a, about a month, or a month and a half, and uh, I remember the weather being pretty good when we first got there, but all I remember after that was there were low clouds uh, and kind of, kind of dreary. 
Now we know that London had been hit repeatedly. The areas that you were in, did you see much um, landscape ruin no. because of the war? No. Well, uh, see, we went to two camps when we were there. The first one was uh, Camp Stacy, something like that. And uh, we were confined uh, to quarters all the time. Uh, although somebody got out because one time they uh, made us all line up and uh, a captain and uh, a woman walked up and down the file and looked at us because somebody had, had raped her. Oh. Somebody had cut and out and, and raped her. And did you know that was the reason you were being mm -hmm. called yeah, out? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't remember who told us, but we did, yeah. Was uh, that very common back then? It's the only one I heard of. Mm -hmm. One time I heard of them. Did they find the person? I never heard any more about it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they found her or not. Mm -hmm. no. uh, but then from there we went to a... a another camp in, in Wales, and we were there a few weeks also. And you said you were confined to quarters, so how did you spend a typical day? Well, so-called training, which, which is really uh, exercises, I guess, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, with our rifles and running and all that sort of stuff. Just to keep in shape. Yeah. Uh -huh. And and you said you were in England and then Wales for about a month, month and a half. Yeah. Uh -huh. At that time, were you hearing on a daily basis about the war effort at all? We must have, although I don't remember too well, except for one instance. There was one, another guy that came to us, uh, and he'd been over there as a replacement. He'd been wounded, and he was going back again to, uh, to Normandy. I remember uh, he was telling us about the awful times he had, and um, uh, and uh, I remember specifically to, uh, his saying that they would take German soldiers. You may not want me to say this, but they'd take German soldiers behind the hedgerows and, and shoot them. Oh. And w these would be uh, soldiers that they had taken as prisoners. Prisoners, uh -huh. so they would shoot them. Yeah, I don't know how often it happened, but I know. I remember this fellow telling us that. When he was telling you this story, was he telling it in a forlorn manner or in a bragging type of manner? I think it was bragging. Mm -hmm. yeah. And did you all believe him? I think so. Mm -hmm. I had, you know, a little bit skeptical, but I, you know, I think I believed him. Yeah. Did it really leave you with any kind of thoughts about what you were getting into? Yeah, I didn't want to go. <laughs> you didn't want to go? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. But after Wales, what happened? Okay, I, I think it was from there that, that we went to, uh, uh, let me see, that was it Portsmouth? I'm sorry, Plymouth. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 turned back for, for Europe. Uh, I might say this is, uh, we, uh, we were marching, you know, t treading uh, along, going to, uh, to Plymouth, and a, and a young boy joined me. He came walking with me, yeah. and um, he said that I remember. He said that they'd been hit by the buzz bombs. That was the V1, the German weapons. Yes, tell us what a buzz bomb is. Okay, that that's a, a mechanized a non. Uh, you know, didn't have any pilot, pilotless, um, and and uh, there was there was shot over from. Uh, I, th I think the main launching sites were in either Belgium or Netherlands. And I believe most of them were aimed at London, and uh, they had a lot of explosives. They weren't as bad as the V2s, which was, were the see the words escape me. They were the real big things, but uh, the uh, V2 being larger than the, the uh, B, the, the B1s. B1. You could see the B1s, and we were told that our pilots could actually fly with them, and then if they were lucky, they could tip their wings and and knock them off course, you know. Uh, but the V2s, they were um, the speed of sound, or, or exceeded the speed of sound, so all you knew was a, you know, the explosion hitting. And the V2 was also pilotless? Yes. Both were? Uh-huh. Do you, so this young boy told you that his town had been hit? Yeah, by the V1s, uh-huh, yeah. How old a boy was he? I'd, I'd say maybe seven or eight, yeah. So did you befriend him? Well, this is walking while we were walking toward the uh, boat for embarkation to uh, to Normandy. Uh, so he talked with me. 
Uh, apparently he liked me and I liked him, but we kept on walking, we just talked. Uh, incidentally, there were quite a few boats, uh, ships in the, uh, in the harbor, and they, they, I think they all had those uh, balloons, I don't know what they call them now. I should have read my story before. Okay. <laughs> uh, but, but they were to protect from being strafed by the German aircraft. So they were balloons that were, correct me if I'm wrong, hanging by wire? Yeah, they had a cable. Cable. Up them, uh -huh, yeah. And they would hang in the air? Yeah. And I think the way it worked is the German places, if they came into strafe, they would hit the cable and uh, they, would, they would be destroyed. Mm -hmm. So was that the those. first time you had seen something like that? Yeah, but, but there was a, uh, there might have been some, uh, but that's the first I remember anyway. Although I know there's the common joke, you know, saying that if it wasn't for those balloons up there, England would have, would have sunk from uh, the weight of all our equipment and ammunition that were sent over. So and you uh, knew that you were bound for Normandy, or mm -hmm. you thought you were. Did you get actual orders that you were going to Normandy? I don't remember, of course I was a private. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we get, we get everything through a second hand or just word passed down. Sure. Uh, but uh, I'm sure we must have known, although I don't remember anyone actually telling us. Did you get on those flat bottom boats? Well, later. The first one we got on was, uh, it was a Princess Margaret. Uh, uh, and uh, it was a, gee, I, I used to know what that was, but, it, but, it, but it's a private ship, I guess you'd call it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the crew was all uh, uh, were all English sailors, and, and we could fed crew. yeah we could fed English f uh, food. And, and where did they take you? Uh, they took us uh, to to um, Normandy to um, Utah, there's Utah Beach and there's uh, Omaha. They took us to Omaha Beach, yeah. And f from that we got onto one of those flat bottom boats. We get on that and then onto the beach. What was it like coming up to the beach front? Was there a lot of devastation there, or had that been long gone and it was pretty... No, there's still quite a bit of devastation. There were some sunken ships we could see. Uh, it was um, approaching dusk. I'll tell you, might as well tell you this. I hope you can erase whatever you don't need of this. <laughs> but uh, it was approaching dusk and there were, uh, they, there were, oh, I don't know, 50 or 100 uh, German soldiers uh, in, in, uh, enclosed in a wire, enclosure, which had just been strung up there. And, uh, and like I said, it was getting dark, dusk anyway, and a German plane came over and strafed. Uh, but mostly our, our guns uh, were shooting up at the, the plane. And, and they, our guns, would fire some of those fluorescent bullets. I, I don't think it was every bullet, but it, some, so you could see the uh, bullets going up toward the plane. But the plane didn't get hit, the plane just made this one pass and was gone. And, uh, and that, 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 that's all I remember. We got onto the beach and uh, we assembled and we marched. Now at that time, I think we'd only gone, you know, the invasion went very slowly. It was way behind schedule. You know? And I think they'd only gone maybe 10 miles inland. When you arrived, they were yeah. only 10 miles ahead of you. Uh-huh, yeah. When you, when you s heard the bombs and, and the strafing, do you remember the noise, what it was like? Uh, not particularly, really. Well, at that time, there wasn't that much bombing. There was a strafing. And, and, and clarify for me strafing. Uh, well, well, just the, the, uh, the, the plane had a machine gun, or machine guns, and would fire them as it, as it zoomed down on, on this target and, and, and came parallel with the coast. It was firing its guns and strafing whatever was on the beach. So did you get the sense then that you were really right in the thick of it? I don't recall right at that time. No. no. So you got on the beach and you knew that other troops were only 10 miles ahead of you. You were in infantry, but did you walk immediately or did you get on trucks? What we, we, got, we walked immediately. Mm -hmm. And that first night we walked a lot. Uh, and uh, we must have been walking parallel to the front because otherwise we would have you know, gone uh, past the front. Uh, and then I know, I know we, uh, we wound up in a, a churchyard. It was dark, pitch dark, or, or very dark. And we, and we uh, slept uh, on the, uh, I think it was a grave, mm -hmm. a graveyard right there at the church. And the church was pretty well demolished. But that, that's where we slept the first night. During that time period that you were walking and going through 
what I would assume damaged villages, the church being damaged, mm -hmm. damaged also. Did you see any of the French villagers or townsfolk at all? Not at that time, because it was dark. No, mm -hmm. You're talking about the first day, the first well, the night. the first few days. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, even after that, no, because we, we did, again, we walked quite a bit, uh, uh, I think a couple of days, uh, uh, and we were going through what they call replacement depots. And uh, it would be from one hedge, hedge row, of one field to another. No, I don't remember seeing any French people at, at that time. We did see them later. But. And walking as you were, uh, uh, what kind of a load were you carrying with you? How, how heavy was it? I know it would be your own personal effects, but mm. how heavy was the backpack that oh, you okay. might be carrying? At, at that time, it wasn't that heavy compared to what we carried later. Mm -hmm. But uh, and I don't remember specifically, but I'm sure we had a couple of blankets. At, uh, uh, yeah, they call a, it's a half of a tent, a, a, a two-man pup tent, I don't remember mm -hmm. what they called it, half a no, whatever it was. Uh, I guess we had our rifles and, and some ammunition. I can't even remember that for sure, but th I think that's it. So we were loaded with stuff, but not as loaded as we would be later. Mm -hmm. And did you know at that time where you were walking to? No idea. Mm. So they didn't keep you informed, just sort of follow? Oh, oh no, because you know, there's no organization to really, we didn't, you know, we were replacements. Uh, mm. And uh, uh, no, we didn't know where we were, where we were going. That came a little later. So tell us about that. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I can't remember just when it happened, but so at one point or other, they, they divided us up and they said that this group, I think about 15 of us were going to the 4th Division, for the 4th Infantry Division. And they must have gone alphabetically because there was myself, my name was a Q, there was a fellow named Quick, also from Massachusetts someplace, a guy named Pepe, P Q, a guy R, uh, Ryan. Uh, so there about 15 of us that were taken from the group of replacements that got off the boat and was, was said we were going to the Fourth Division. As a matter of fact, we went uh, to the, tw the 12th Regiment and Company K, so the, the Groovers went there as replacements. And uh, where was there? Was it well, Normandy? Uh, in Normandy, yes. Uh -huh. um, I guess after we were assigned to the 4th Division, they must, the 4th Division must have sent someone to pick us up. His name was Sergeant Ramsey. I know because he was killed a couple of weeks later uh, with a bullet through his throat. <laughs> Were you there when that happened? Yes. Do you remember it? Yes. What was that like knowing that this was one of your leaders that died in front w of you? Well, uh, that, that, we had quite a bit of that later on, but uh, when he picked us up, he was the sergeant, but uh, I, we didn't, didn't know what he was, or, didn't know he was a leader, but he just came to show us to the, where the company care of the 4th Division was. So you would literally come in and replace a division, and they would ship home? No. No? No, the division stayed there. We just became a part of the division. Okay. We just replaced people that were killed or wounded oh and my. were out of there. Okay. This happened all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, and, and again, I don't remember now if it was two days or three days later, we wound up with the 4th Division. And, uh, uh, you know, if I wonder, uh, uh, stop That's me. That's all but right. uh, it, again, it was getting dark uh, when we got to the fourth division, and uh, oh, maybe four of us went into the captain's tent, and it was a small tent. I think it was a two-man tent also. Now, how we ever fit in there, I don't know. But uh, his name was Captain Gwinner, and uh, I could tell he, even though it was getting dark, I could tell he needed to shave. He didn't have any indication that he was an officer, even no bar showing or anything. But he was very low-key. And um, very nice, I thought. And but he he asked us uh, of the let's say four of us that were there, four or five of us, if any of us had any experience with, mort with mort the 60 millimeter mortars or the light machine guns. And um, you know I remembered the time that you know, the old, an old saying in the army, don't volunteer for anything because uh, if if they're looking for those guys, those are the guys get killed. So, <laughs> but for some reason or other, I put my hand up and. Uh, and I was glad I did it, because I wound up uh, uh, mainly with the machine guns and 60 millimeter mortars, which is the fourth platoon of the company. Um, so uh, then uh, Captain Gwinner introduced us to our platoon leader, K. 
Captain Gruner, by the way, was killed about two months later in the Hurton Forest. Uh, and then he, our platoon leader was um, Matthews, Lieutenant Matthews. And he was, I only knew him for two minutes. He was a real nice guy, though. I th I, he was young, I think he was maybe 26. And uh, he tried to put us at ease, I remember, because he uh, tried to crack a few jokes, you know, and very lightly. He got killed, I don't know when or where. He was killed also. So a lot of the ones that were your leaders yeah, let me, uh, didn't make it. Yeah, this, uh, it, it's not as bad as this all the but, but still, then he introduces to our first sergeant, who was a sergeant to Michael. And uh, he was, you know, I didn't know much about him. He was kind of cold, kind of a dark Italian fellow. And he was killed about a week later. And he got, if I could tell you, he got shot, a, a sniper shot him uh, th right through his helmet, from through his head, and he went down like that. And, and, th and then he took us to our section leader, which was Sergeant Grimes, and he was one of the nicest guys I've ever known, very nice guy. He survived the war. It's nice to hear that a few did, yeah. right? Seeing all of this happen around you, was this a big challenge to you on a day-to-day -day basis, just staying alive? Yes, it certainly was. That was that was our main concern, really. There was nothing else that mattered. There were times that, you know, I know we're not going to go into this, but like in the Hurricane Forest where we were pretty hungry and, and didn't have any water, but our main concern was staying alive. Now tell us about it, Herkley Forest? No, Her Herkin. Sorry, yeah. can you spell that? Yeah, H-U-R, I think it's H-U-R-T-G-E-N. And where was that? That's in Germany. It's on the Siegfried Line, actually. But that was not until November. So what happened between June and November? Were you okay. marching north? Uh, well, or, or, I'll make this as fast as I can, but um, right after we met, you know, right after we forgot there with Captain Gwinner and lieutenants and so forth, um, we were told there was going to be a big break, break out of St. Lowe. Uh, St. Lowe, the, the, we, we were, American and British troops were stuck there at St. Lowe. And um, I think it was the second day we were there, and we were told that this was going to happen. They sent, uh, the the uh, Americans had a, an amazing uh, uh, number of uh, bombers flew over. It, it, I, I have some of this sort of memorized, but I, there's a wave of 1,200 planes that came by, and we you know, got up and looked at them, and it was like, as far as you could see back, there were planes. Uh, and they went beyond us and bombed Germany. And then, after, when, after they'd gone by, and you know how they could, could survive all that, 350 fighter planes came, and they strafed. And then when they'd gone by, another 1,200 fighters came by. I, I, I'm sorry, I mean another 1,200 bombers came by. And after that, 350 more fighters. And then we had, a, I think it was about an hour of artillery. Bombardment. So they were really softening up the... Uh, uh, so that's when we, uh, Americans did break out of St. Louis. And St. Lowe is in, in... In Normandy. In Normandy. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And uh, our, our division uh, supposedly led... Yeah, it was our division led the breakout of St. Lowe. But it wasn't our regiment, it was uh, the 8th Regiment. You know. So they were a little bit ahead of you? Uh-huh, yeah. Uh -huh. But did you hear all of this and oh, yeah. see it all? You oh, yes. saw all of these yes. bombers and... Uh, is that when, the, when those bombers went over, I, I counted, I think it was five of our bombers that got hit. And, and I saw the American airmen jumping out of them. You know, I don't know if they all get out or not, but I could see them jump out. Barely see them, you know, tiny as they were. And then the, uh, the parachutes open. Uh, and then after the first, uh, after about five planes, I, uh, I, uh, I saw very little German flag. And after a while, there was no German flag at all. It seems all the planes just kept coming, going, 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 bombing. Yeah. Well, during that bombing, by the way, one of our generals, General McNair, he was a personal friend of General Eisenhower's, and he was supposed to be just observing uh, this morning. And he was with our, uh, with our regiment behind the lines, and uh, our, things got fouled up, and some of our bombs fell behind the lines, and General McNeil got killed. Uh, so that would be friendly fire. Yes. Uh -huh. He got killed by friendly fire. Yes. That happened occasionally. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, well, because you asked what happened after, after Normandy, because mm. we broke out of Normandy, and I had some pretty bad times there, which I, there in my story there. Tell us a few. Uh, well, 
you know, mainly it's just getting bombed and, and martyred. But yeah, I'd like to tell you this uh, occasion where a friend of mine, uh, uh, his name is Jim Jim Impolar and I, um, went to the first aid station. And, uh, and then and we were told to, uh, to go uh, to wait uh, at a certain foxholes over there. But anyway, uh, I think we were within sight of the, where the Germans could see us because uh, they just poured artillery and mortar shell on us. On, uh, and uh, there was just Jim and I in these two foxholes. So they must have thought there was a whole company there because they just kept pounding us. And p the, uh, the foxholes, they were, uh, uh, they were so narrow that, that they were, we were, there were individual foxholes. So I was in one and Jim was in the other. And, uh, and the foxhole would just shake you know, it, uh, it was just, the, it was so furious, the uh, artillery was so furious. So if you were standing in a foxhole, how, but, how were you below the ground level? We, we'd never stand in a foxhole. You would the, crouch? The, the, yeah, the, the deepest foxhole I ever had was uh, about four feet deep, and that was a, and the, the, the deepest I ever dug one. That was in, in Paris, and I never got to sleep in it anyway. <laughs> uh, but no, uh, sometimes uh, there were just, Five or six inches deep, because it would run into stones and rocks. And uh, but hopefully, if we could get them two or three feet deep, two feet deep. So you and your friend were stuck in these two foxholes, mm -hmm. getting shelled. Mm -hmm. What was going through your mind at that point in time? I'm not religious, but I was praying to, to stay alive. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's all I can remember. Uh, did you even bother to try to fire back, or was it useless Impossible. to do that? Mm -hmm. You couldn't see anything. You couldn't see sure. the enemy at all. The fire was just But after uh, maybe an hour of that bombardment, it kind of quieted down. They must have thought they'd kill us. And uh, Jim stuck up his head, stuck his head up, and I stuck mine up. And we looked at each other, and I know he looked like a, like a dead man, pale. And what are we going to do? We just didn't know what to do. So after I said, we've got to get out of here. And we took off and began running. And, uh, the, uh, they, they must have watched us, and they began sending in water shells after us again. Uh, so, until finally we, we came to an um, anti American anti-tank gun, and we stayed with him for a while, because that was behind one hill. They couldn't, uh, couldn't reach us there. Uh, okay. Um, but okay. Anyway, th there were quite a few cases like that. But let me just uh, quickly tell about this, also, because uh, this, this was the one good part of it. And uh, that was the liberation of Paris. Because uh, uh, I think it was a few weeks after that, uh, our 12th Regiment, which we were part of, were the first American troops in Paris. And uh, there was an, uh, a French unit to win in also. But, uh, um, and uh, the, the uh, French people, well, this sort of answers the questions you asked before about the people in Normandy. Mm -hmm. When we did see people in Normandy, which was little, not the first day or two after that, they were very cold to, toward us because they had suffered damage, their houses, their fields, their, their, their animals. We saw a lot of dead cows and horses. Uh, so they were kind of cold to us. And also, from what I've read later, I think the Germans in Normandy uh, acted correctly. You know, they treated the French people all right. But as we got to Paris and we began marching in toward Paris, the people got just more and more enthusiastic about us, toward us. And, uh, and then as we kept walking, they would line up along the streets. We were in the suburbs of Paris. And uh, it reminded me of the, uh, the marathon when through Framingham and Natick. The people would have their hands out and you know, would touch their hands as they went by. And then they brought flowers, they brought food, they brought uh, wine also. Then after a while, I guess we, we weren't going fast enough, so the trucks came and there wasn't any enemy. I told you, so we got on the trucks. And then, and that's when we were actually were in Paris. And the, the Parisians were just went wild. They were yelling, screaming, and uh, and we were on a truck at that time. And the, the, the girls would climb on the trucks, you know, and they would bring uh, wine, whiskey, and and we'd and as the girls come in, we'd kiss them, and pass them on to the next guy, kiss them, and pass them on. To them. And the same with the liquor and wine, we'd take a swig and pass it on. So uh, they, it was a. It was a happy moment yeah, in a very difficult was, time. Yeah. So you were part of that liberation. Yes, uh, yeah. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. During that period of time, did you get any time off at all? No, we didn't. Uh, the 28th Division uh, marched through 
Paris. They, they actually marched through and, and you know. Uh, but we went through Paris, and that's kind of a long story, but I won't go into that. But we wound up on the outskirts of Paris in a, um, a park. I know the name of it, but it doesn't come to me right now. B Boy de Vicennes. Right? And, uh, and we were there, and we were bombed by, uh, that night by uh, German aircraft. Now, th that's the first time I was, you know, we were bombed by American aircraft occasionally, but uh, the German um, Air Force is pretty much defunct uh, when we were there. But that night we were bombed by some German aircraft, and it was pretty scary. And, and that's where uh, I mentioned digging a four foot hole. Well, uh, when they would bomb, we didn't have time to dig, but there was a crater there, so I and several other people jumped into the crater. And the plane dropped some flares, which made it seem like daylight out. You know, it was, it was pretty scary, you know, because it was so bright out. Uh, and they did drop bombs, but not right near us, so none of us, our group was killed. But the next morning we got an order that everyone was to dig foxholes. Uh, because, uh, not because of fear of the Germans, but we we're going to bring in uh, anti aircraft. And so the anti aircraft might fall on us when it do foxholes. So another buddy I had, which was a real good friend, Leo One Year, uh, he was an a, a Irish Indian from Dubuque, Iowa. Uh, turned out to be a, my best friends. Uh, and he and I dug a foxhole. We borrowed a, a long shovel from our kitchen and we dug a foxhole about four feet deep. We filled it with uh, leaves, made it nice and comfortable. We put uh, branches over it and then those jerry cans, you know, on top of that, and dirt. Then we never used it <laughs> because the next morning we, we marched out again. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you, did you get the sense that this was the beginning of the end for, uh, for the war or we, not? We, we thought it was at that time mm -hmm. because uh, uh, we, at that time I think we all thought that the war would be ending maybe in a couple of weeks, certainly not through Christmas. And I remember one time, after this, right, Tony, but as we were walking, and again through a small village, and the people were glad to see us. And I remember some of the old people saying, La guerre fini, la guerre fini. They thought the war was over already. And at, at that time, it might have seemed like it because there was no German. The Germans had taken off running back to the Germans, the Siegfried Line or the West Wall. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we, we did think, it was, uh, hoping, praying that it was almost over. Uh, but it wasn't for you. But it wasn't, no. Tell no. us more. Well, uh, after. Paris, we kept on marching, uh, and uh, we had, well, I guess they call it a forced march because we, would, we couldn't keep up with the Germans because they would, they would just, well, I'm skipping one little part, but I can't tell the whole story, but, you know, uh, but, but anyway, eventually we would uh, uh, chase the Germans back to their, uh, their, their border. I forget what I was going to say. Um, sorry. So sorry, were you no. going through Belgium at this point in yes. time? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh -huh, yeah, and we, we still uh, didn't meet any enemy activity at that time. Oh, but you know, we were moving so fast that we got on trucks, and we would ride uh, the trucks for a while and, and hike for a while. So between hiking and riding, we covered many miles we, until we got to the German border, and then and then we came to an abrupt stop. <laughs> on the border. Uh -huh, yeah, in the, in the Siegfried Line, actually. And tell, tell us, someone else that was interviewed re recently mentioned the Siegfried Line. Could you explain that for those who might be watching this tape? It, yeah, it's sometimes called the West Wall, but it's uh, some fortifications that uh, Hitler had made. Uh, and uh, they were extremely um, well fortified with big pillboxes, so that even big guns hitting them would just bounce off them or just do minimal damage. So were they cement? Yes, uh -huh, mm -hmm. yeah. Cement. And then on top of the cement there was dirt also. And, and then there were, there were plans so that the machine guns would have crossfire and cover them also. Uh, so it was, it was very difficult to get through. Now the, uh, when we got to the Siegfried Line, the first couple of pillboxes weren't occupied. Uh, but after that they were, and with the machine guns and all that. And um, frankly, uh, uh, we advanced very little in the next uh, three months, I guess. We, we got the Siegfried Line in September, the early part of September. And we were there October. In November, in November we were in the Hurricane Forest, but that's still part of the Siegfried Line. And then it wasn't really until uh, in December when the, um, the Battle of the Bulge. Were you involved in the Battle of yes, the Bulge? Uh -huh. Tell us about yeah. that. Okay. Um, so would that have been? What month was that? That was in December. December sixteenth. Yeah. Nineteen. Uh, Forty-four. Forty-four. 
Well, I, I might just back up just a little sure. bit. Sure. Because uh, we were in the Hurricane Forest that happened just before that, in the, um, which is in the Siegfried Line. And... Um, Did you have uh, major battle in the forest? Yeah. Well, uh, there was a... Um, um, a, a sawmill. So we call it something the sawmill, and it was, it was almost level, you know, from artillery, both German and ours. And the, the 28th Division had been there before. We, uh, before we, there was another division there also. Uh, I can't remember the number. They just got mutilated, and then I, th I think it was the 30th. And then the 28th took over from them, and they got mutilated. And then we uh, were sent in first. It was just our 12th Regiment was sent in. And now, when you were sent in, did you know what had occurred prior to your going in? No. Not until after? After, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But we were going there, and again, it was pitch dark. And that, that's a story in itself, you know, we were marching in mud. And I remember uh, uh, we met somebody from the 28th Division who was going to lead us to where we would be. And I remember asking, I asked him, I said, well, how are you? Always hoping for the best, you know. <laughs> I said, how was it up there? You know, and he says, they're throwing everything at us but the kitchen sink. It's an old saying, I remember him saying that, <laughs> it was true. And you mentioned the mud, that's something that we've heard repeatedly also. Was it cold, rainy, spring, uh, it was, summer? It was, it was cold and rainy. Uh, when we got to the Siegfried Line, and the certain forest also, it was muddy and cold. Mud and this uh, was in the winter actually, the beginning uh, of the winter. Yeah, well actually November, November. I think it was November 7th, mm -hmm. your anniversary today. Mm -hmm. No, this is December, I'm sorry. Uh, that we, it was November. November seventh, we uh, when we got into the Siegfried Line, and it just started getting cold and real cold. And after about the first week uh, uh, at the Hurricane Forest, so what I meant to say, we're going to the Hurricane Forest. Uh, is it actually started to snow, and um, uh, and it is uh, since I was with the 60 millimeter models and, and the machine guns at that time, we stayed at the so-called sawmill, but there was practically nothing there. There was just it was all level, but nevertheless there was a little. We call it a cellar hole, but actually it was a little uh, hole um, underground uh, uh, which serviced, uh, in, in the old days, uh, they, they serviced the sauce and whatnot for the sawmill. And we'd get in there, and uh, we, could, we couldn't stand, uh, we, but we could just about approach and sit, and sit side by side there. And uh, so we were a little protected from the German guns because we were half under, or sort of underground. But on the other hand, they knew we were there. They had it well zeroed in, and they just bombed us con constantly, you know, artillery and uh, and mortars. <coughs> so how long were you in the forest? From the seventh until the end of the month, all of virtually all of November, and there were quite a few casualties. Yeah, and uh, and there were quite a few um, battle fatigue cases also. Uh, there's some, uh, at least one that I. Uh, I think it was a self-inflicted wound. I'm sure there was more than that. Not yeah. fatal, but just enough to get them out? Right, uh-huh, yeah. yeah. So you were there for about a month. Uh-huh, yeah. Did you feel that it can't get any worse? I mean, well, you, yeah. were, you were a young man yeah. in a foreign country fighting yeah. for your life. Yeah. Well, you know, the feeling there, I think with all of us, was that there's no way we could get out of that and not get either hurt or, or, or killed. Because you know, by the law of averages, no reason to say this, and we repeat these old things, uh, but um, uh, because you'd, you'd go up there at the front line and you get killed or you get wounded and, and uh, removed, and then you get replacements and you continue on. And then there'd be more killed, more wounded, and more replacements. And, and there'd just be no way to wish to hate to see replacements come in. We'd love to be replaced, which we were a couple of times, and then we'd go back and Regimental Reserve, or, or but uh, we were always in the front lines. Were you wounded during this period yeah, of time? Yeah, well, I, I went by that. That was uh, uh, that was in, in, in the Siegfried Line before the uh, Hurricane Forest. Uh, and that's where it's kind of hard, there's not too much to say because we're just constantly, um, well, being fired on or artillery coming in. Most of the time you couldn't see, in fact, throughout the war, most of the time you couldn't see the enemy. Uh, I, I, I just remember, I think uh, right now all I can remember is once when I actually aimed at a German and, and fired my rifle. Now the, uh, uh, I'm sorry I'm hopping all over the place, but it's the only way I can tell it. That's fine. Uh, but I, the, 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 so that was the only time you were really close enough 
As far as seeing one. And, and that wasn't very close either, mm -hmm. but I could see them, you know, mm -hmm. and I could fire them. I don't know if I hit them or not. Uh, and the, um, uh, the, the 60 millimeter, millimeter mortars that we, were, we would fire, uh, we didn't fire them very often. We fired them in Normandy a couple of times. Uh, and we, now, we were in the Hurricane Frost, we fired them a lot. That, that's the only time we fired them a lot. But we couldn't see where we were firing. You know, <laughs> we just had them set up. And, uh, and then when the uh, stuff wasn't coming in, the uh, artillery and so on, we'd run out there and fire going the other way. But uh, I have no idea if they were effective or not. Uh, you sort of brushed over your, your yeah. injury, but yeah. was it severe? No, no, it wasn't. It was a minor injury. It was injury. a minor wound, uh -huh, yeah. And what would happen? You're in the middle of this war and well, you're injured. Yeah, and, and it was nighttime also. And like I say, it was a minor injury, a, a broken bone, but, uh, uh, and, uh, they took me back to the aid station, which uh, wasn't very far, uh, battalion air station, uh, aid station, and um, and they uh, looked at it and they um, bound it up, X-rayed it, and then bound it up. They had some equipment there, you know, for X-rays, and then they sent me back to um, I think it was a regimental field, what they called a field, where they took some more X-rays, and then they, they finally I wound up with a a. a, a, a was it a hospital or a I know the names of these things, but I don't, don't recall them. Um, and so I was there for two weeks. I was out of action for two weeks, and it was very nice there. <laughs> when you're out of action for two weeks, were you able to write home a little more often? Uh, I don't know. If more, I did write home. You, your family must have heard that you had yeah, been injured. Yeah, but my mother says she didn't hear uh, that I was injured from the War Department. Uh, until after I was already back in action, and, and sent her a message saying, saying everything was fine. Oh, this is the way I wrote my letters. Everything's fine. I just feel great. Nothing, no problem. And in the meantime, and she's got a letter there saying that I was wounded. Uh, so uh, once you got back into action, were you able to get back with the original group that you yes, were with? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. They sent me right back, and they hadn't moved at all from where I was when I uh, when I got hurt. They were still there. The same fellows. They were glad to see me. You know, and I was glad to. See I was glad to see them, and I hated to be back. Sure. You know. um, okay. Uh, so you oh, went uh, through the forest. You're in the Siegfried line. You're sort of at a standstill. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. So it was like the end of November, and we were pulled back from the um, Hurton Forest. Now I think at that time we were almost through the, the, the forest. The forest wasn't that big. Uh, I, since then, I've looked up the dimensions, and I think it was like. Ten miles by I don't know maybe five miles, and the, the story as I understand it, was, there's no there was no need for us to go through that. That, that was really a hell. It was a terrible a battle, um, uh, because they could have just gone around it with tanks and went up. They couldn't they couldn't get tanks through the Hurricane Forest. It was mud trees. Uh, there used to be a lot of tree bursts, you know, which uh, you, you didn't stand a chance against. Now, what would a tree burst be? Well, w with all the uh, trees that were there, uh, and uh, they they would. Um, uh, especially the mortars, I guess. As soon as they hit the branches, they would explode and they would go downwards. So uh, you, you couldn't, if you hit the, uh, the lie flat, it wouldn't do any good. In fact, you'd be exposing yourself more. So uh, since I've read that the thing to do is to get up against a tree, hug a tree, then it had less chance of getting hit. I didn't know that, or I didn't hear that at that time. Besides, I wouldn't feel like hugging a tree. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but that, yeah, so there are a lot of tree bursts. And, and the forest itself, it, uh, it, you know the the, um, the forest looked horrible. You know the, the trees were like uh, I guess it was like toothpicks. You know they were all spl splintered. And, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, so toward the end of the month, uh, we were almost through, and we we were pulled back. And another division came in. I don't remember the, the name of it, uh, but I, I've got to tell you this story, and I hope you can cut it out if, it, if you're overrunning. Um, we had one. You know we we did have. Captains and, and uh, lieutenants who were killed and come and gone. Uh, we had one who I thought a lot of. His name was Roundtree, Roundtree Bob Roundtree. And um, uh, he uh, he was our acting company commander at that time, although he was only a lieutenant. And uh, let me see now. Okay, we had been pulled back a little bit. And another division had gone in there, and and then. Uh, Bert came around and, and said that uh, uh, we were to go and um, hold a, uh, 
a, a road, I think they called it a roadblock. And so they wanted some, quote, volunteers, you know, which they never volunteers, uh, to go up and hold them. But there was somebody already, uh, uh, I think they called it a, a cavalry unit, already holding it. And, uh, and anyway, I was one of the volunteers. I really, I was picked, but, uh, but they uh, said I was a volunteer. And, uh, but uh, I, I, my sergeant told me, don't worry, there's nothing there. That's, uh, they're already, someone's holding the cavalry unit, and uh, all you guys just have to go there, just go there, replace them, and then you'll be back by, I remember he said, you'll be back by 10 o'clock for lunch. Uh, and, uh, of course, they were still in foxholes, you know, but we're back behind the lines a little bit. And uh, so we went, uh, the, and our group from the, uh, our company, and then there was another group from, you know, I company and the other three companies. Uh, and we walked single file along a, a muddy road, and then we got to a point, and the, the auto came back to stop, face left up the hill, and, uh, and then we started going up the hill, and, you know, they, they began shooting at us, you know. Um, and uh, anyway, uh, quite a few guys got killed. Uh, and we got to the, uh, where the cavalry unit was, uh, and we, did, we took over from them. And then after a while, uh, someone else came and replaced us, and we did get back to our unit. But it was, it was dark, it was, uh, uh, it was like six o'clock at night. And since that was uh, the end of November, it was pretty dark by then. And uh, two guys uh, uh, that I, you know, uh, I keep changing the names of these people, but it's because we did change, you know. I'd have a foxhole buddy one week, uh, one day, and the next day I'd have someone else. So this day when I got back, uh, the two foxhole guys I had were Sergeant O'Connell and Sergeant Crow, uh, Private Krause. And they were so glad to see me, you know, they had a three-man foxhole. And uh, so they let me sleep in the middle. And that was a real uh, honor, <laughs> because if you slip on the edge, if you just moved it all, you could dirt down the back of your neck and you didn't have any room to move. In, in the middle, you had, you know, you... So they cut, gave uh, you that privilege because of what you had just been through? Gone through? Yeah, uh -huh, yeah, yeah. So we were in the foxhole maybe a half hour, pitch dark out by that time, and uh, then the word came down, we were moving out again, you know. So, oh, it can't be, we just got back, you know, and going out again. And then we heard uh, uh, that Lieutenant Roundtree, who I th thought so much of, I heard his voice, you know, and he was a real... Um, What's the, what's the word? Um, go getter. So you know, he, he, but not the kind that you disliked. You know, he, uh, and I heard him say, you know, words to the effect that uh, this is ridiculous. We got orders to go. We don't know where we're going. We don't know why we're going. And it's dark, and we're going. Uh, and uh, and you know, <clears throat> and we're in the foxhole, and we, we hear some of the people say, you know, well, we're not going to go. This is ridiculous. You know, and I remember one guy, a uh, uh, southern guy saying, uh, I can't go, uh, I can't find my shovel. <laughs> and, you know, he was serious, but, uh, but uh, it's true, the shovel was the most important thing, you know. Um, but anyway, he went. Uh, we, we all went, and we, and again, with pitch dark, we're following the guy in front of us. You know, you couldn't, uh, couldn't see anything. You try to hold, maybe touch the guy once in a while to see who's, who's there. Uh, and then pretty soon we heard a, a loud explosion, and then another loud explosion. Uh, and then uh, no one knows what's going on, what's happening. There's no other artillery coming in, just two loud explosions. Then pretty soon the line starts moving. And this is the way it is in the infantry. You know? The line starts moving and you start following the guy in front of you. You don't know where, where they're going. Or he doesn't know where he's going. <laughs> uh, and, you know, uh, we went, you know, almost all night, I guess, or, or, large, or, or until maybe the middle of the night. I know at one time uh, uh, we stopped and the guy that I thought I was following, I wasn't following, was someone else. Uh, and uh, then the next, and then, uh, then at one point we stopped, and my buddy one year was there, and he said, "Well, the hell with this. We'll just stop." And we just stopped. You know, there was no artillery coming in anyway. Dropped our equipment and just went to sleep there. And uh, the next morning, got light out. Still no artillery coming in. And then we saw them carry out two bodies. You know. One was that Lieutenant Roundtree. He had died. Yeah. Uh, well, what happened with him? Um, th there were mines. We, we walked into a minefield. And he got his legs blown off. And uh, what I was told was that, that he was begging uh, for uh, someone to shoot him. You know? uh, and uh, and, and, and the, 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 so there were two explosions. The other guy was uh, someone that was, a lieutenant that was attached to our unit. I don't know who he was or not. They both got killed anyway. Uh, <coughs> I might add this. After the war, the first year after the war, I got a letter from uh, Mr. Uh, Lieutenant Roundtree's parents.
Do you still have that letter? No, I wish I had. Do you remember what it said? Yes, uh huh. Uh, it just, it just wanted, it, they were writing to, to, I guess, virtually anyone they knew from K Company who might have known his son and what happened to him. Did you ever write back to them? Yes, I did. It had to be very difficult for them to also write in, for that matter, for you to yes, write back uh -huh. to them too. Yeah, yeah. But actually, you know, I told them, I told them what had happened as far as a, a, a woodwalk in the minefield. But I told them that a, a Bob was killed immediately. You know, mm -hmm. didn't suffer at all. You know. mm -hmm. uh, that's all. And then, oh, I don't know, maybe a year, two years after that, I got another, another letter from them, from Lieutenant Roundtree's father, saying that they'd brought his body back. That I, I think they had him buried there in France. And they brought him back to. Uh, see, I don't remember what state he was from now, but uh, I think it was the Midwest someplace. How old a man was he? I would guess around 26. Yeah. This had to be such a nightmare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I could sidetrack there. I don't know how I got off on that. But anyway, okay, because you're talking about uh, the uh, Battle of the Bulge. Uh, because uh, that was the, the end of November. And, um, and well, the rumor at that time was that we'd been through so much. You know, we'd been getting this rumor all since I landed on D-Day that uh, you know, the, the 4th Division, especially the 12th Regiment, had been through so much. We're going to go to a real, get a real rest, maybe even back to England, and maybe even back in the States. <laughs> you know, the story we got, and I, I, to this day I don't know if it's true or not, but uh, when I first got there, I was told that the 12th Division used to be uh, uh, the, uh, the President's Honor Guard. I don't even know what that means. You know? But therefore we would get special treatment, and we were, we were going back. <clears throat> so at that time in November, they said we were going to get a, a good rest this time. A couple of times uh, in, in Normandy, they said we were going to get a rest, and then it, it turned out that it wasn't that, or it just didn't work out that way. Well, this time, they did have a rest plan for us. Uh, they were sending us to uh, what had been a quiet front in Lux uh, Luxembourg, <clears throat> where uh, uh, there was a river, I don't remember the name of it, and across the river you could see German bunkers, and you, cause you, could, you could actually see the German, some German soldiers occasionally walking around out there, and it was almost as though uh, there was an understanding they wouldn't shoot on us and we wouldn't shoot on them. But uh, I'm getting ahead of it, the story. Uh, so they, uh, they, they pulled us out of the Hurricane Forest and they put us on a, a train, uh, these 40 and 8s. They sent us uh, through Bel uh, from Luxembourg, in, anyway, into Luxembourg. And we went to a little town, uh, I think it was called Hebron, uh, and, uh, and we replaced another division that was there who had been resting there or had been taken easy for a couple of months. So the first two, three, four days, I don't remember now, that we were there on, the, on that line in Luxembourg, it was quiet. Uh, we were a little village there. The Germans would send over an occasional shell, which didn't bother us because, you know, we, we were living in a house, uh, you know, there were houses there, no, no civilians. Uh, the rooms had a single light bulb, which was great, you know, and no heat, but, but a single light bulb. Uh, and, 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 uh, and our people, our artillery, I guess, would send over occasional shell over to the German side. But as far as we knew, this is a quiet front. This is terrific, you know. And uh, we, we found some potatoes. We made French fries. They were great. And then, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, and then on December 16th, uh, yeah, the night of the 15th and uh, the morning of the 16th, that, that was the day the uh, Battle of the Bulge started. And uh, we were asleep, you know, and we were up in, in our beds in the second floor, I remember, you know, about well, three of us in the bed. Of course, we had all our clothes on. I don't think we had our boots on, because we take our boots off. There. And all of a sudden, you know, there's a lot of artillery coming in, instead of just the one occasional one. And then one of them hit the house that we were in. Well, we scrambled, you know, and ran down cellar. And then we could see that there was just constant bombardment coming in, you know. Uh, and, and we still didn't know what was going on. I, I don't think anyone knew, you know, I, I don't think General Eisenhower knew. Uh, and then the next morning, I'll make this as fast as I can, uh, we, we were still, you know, crouched there in the cellar all that sort of coming in, and we were told to get our stuff on, we were marching out. So we get out of the, the, the cellar that was there and lined up on the street, you know, still you know, sort of crouched down wherever we could get any um, cover. And uh, another, there was a guy there I'd never seen before. He was a corporal. His name was Rader. 
I think it's R A E D E R. And he had a big uh, radio strap on his back. Never seen anything like that before, you know. Uh, I th and I, th I think now afterwards, I think he was maintaining communications between uh, battalion and, and the company. I don't know. But I know he was right there where we were. And I know he said, oh, you know, it's nothing to worry about. He said, <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. He said somebody from my company, at one of the outposts, saw uh, a, a called battalion and said that uh, uh, they saw several hundred German uh, soldiers coming out of, you know, advancing. <coughs> and Corporal Rader said uh, the uh, battalion commander, Luckett, I think his name was, uh, had gone to, uh, to England for. Uh, Rest of the corporation or something, and Major Rice uh, had taken over. And he said Major Rice was new; he didn't know what was going on, and he panicked. He said if the Colonel was there, would still be uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, I think it was, would still be, you know, taking it, you know, back in the houses. Well, anyway, we, we did move out, <clears throat> and I, I think we we moved out. I don't know if it was five, five or ten miles, probably five miles, and we went up in, in, uh, into a. Um, I want to say a hill, except it's sort of flat, a plateau, a hill plateau. Mm -hmm. And then from there we looked out and, uh, and we, we could see the Germans coming out of the woods. You know? And I don't know how many, several hundred. Uh, they were advancing toward a, a, a small village, which I think is where our, our eye company was, that we were supposed to go help. Uh, and then, uh, let me see. Yeah, I guess right about that time, you know, whereas we hadn't been fighting until then. Then all of a sudden, all kinds of artillery began coming. Someone just spotted us, and uh, and by the way, that uh, uh, radar it was killed. Uh, this was the radio man. The radio man, yeah. And also, I can't remember who uh, who our company commander was at that time right now, but he was killed also. And there was a lot of confusion. And then when it was all over, there was nobody left except a, a sergeant, and I know his name, but I can't think of it now. Uh, and you know, no one knew. What we were doing, where we were going, what to do, and we went back, right back, the five miles or so that we would come from. To the small town. To, to the small that you town, were yeah. Initially. Uh -huh, yeah, yeah. And then um, uh, uh, let me just uh, sum it up this way. So for the rest of the uh, um, uh, Battle of the Bulge, we were more or less in holding positions because uh, what happened is we were on the very southern end of the Bulge in Luxembourg, the very southern end. And the, and the biggest push was further north. And so as long as we held, I thought, well, I guess we must have been doing a good job of holding them. But actually, I, th I think that it was just that uh, there, all the effort was up further north. Also, we were told that the soldiers that we were facing were not the fanatical Nazis, uh, uh, stormtroopers. They were the, uh, I think they call them Volkstroopers, older uh, troops. Uh, uh, so. And, and that went on through uh, into January. So that was almost uh, another month of... More or less really just holding. Uh, but when you say holding, it meant basically holding your position, Yeah. Uh -huh, right. but f fighting to hold it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Fighting, firing our guns whenever, you know, whenever we had to. Uh, then occasionally we'd get a, a, a bit of a rest with people and go someplace uh, place or other. You know. Uh, and uh, see, that's all I can tell you about that. Uh, when did you get shipped home? Uh, that was in um, uh, July of '45. Yeah. In, in the meantime, just to cover that, the rest of that very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, see, January, February, uh, we didn't move much. You know. Then March. Th uh, by March, I think we had so. So much equipment had come over, so much, uh, you know, so many tanks, and, and we had uh, uh, better uh, better equipment, I think, than we, than we used to have. Uh, but my things started opening up, and then in April, I think Germany started falling apart. Um, Did you kind of get the sense at that point in time that you were winning? Yes, I think all along, I felt we were winning. For, for one thing, there, there wasn't any um, any uh, the Luftwaffe, the German aircraft, 
where it was always our aircraft. And uh, as, as badly as I thought we were getting it, with our uh, mortars and, and artillery, I always felt that the Germans were getting twice as much, as, at least, as we were. Mm -hmm. Did you ever get a sense throughout all of the turmoil that you were in, and you were in it almost daily, that you were going to lose it? The war? Lose the war? No, you're just oh. yourself. No. I, you know, and, and that's not bragging uh, at all, because I was tell you, I was scared uh, most of the time I was there. But uh, I did see some fellows that broke, I guess you call it, you know, uh, that uh, at, at the beginning you never thought that they would. And, and they did. They um, had battle fatigue, you know, and then they broke. And knowing that you had mentioned earlier that you got this Dear John letter, was this in the midst of all of this turmoil that you got no, this? No, that was in April. Okay. When the Germans started to fall apart, and we were in regimental reserve at the time, so we were in, in pup tents. So after going through hell, you get a letter. From That's just the way I felt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So at that point, was it almost anticlimactic to you? Yes. That that she was breaking off your yes. relationship. Yeah, I, I wasn't uh, hurt by it at all mm -hmm. at that time. I just wanted to stay alive. And then. Did you have to serve out some t a period of time after all of that that you had been through? Uh, no. Can I tell you one more episode? You sure can. You, the very last day we saw combat, and that was May 4th. The war ended officially May 8th, but May 4th was the very last day. And I thought it was kind of interesting, because uh, at that time, for a week or two before that, we had been moving pretty fast, and, and uh, so we'd ride on, half, on um, tanks or half-tracks. We would hang out to the sides. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, on this May 4th, uh, and again, you know, before that, uh, the, the Germans were falling apart. Uh, so, uh, the Germans were surrendering, would come by, and they'd come by uh, so often, we'd just wave them back sometimes. We wouldn't bother, to, you know, trying to lead them back or anything, just go back, go back. Uh, so on May 4th, we get on the, uh, this column of, uh, I think, three tanks and three tanks and a half, two half trucks, maybe with four tanks. Two half trucks. Then there was miscellaneous ger uh, German cars that the soldiers had picked up, and uh, we were in the half tracks, the, uh, our, our section. And uh, so we, we were going moving along in the trucks, and it was it was quiet. There was no one shooting, but the the guys had had a, some of them had a little bit of drink. You know, this happens. Uh, and as we went along, um, they began shooting. It, it, nothing. They just having fun. You know? And then all of a sudden the, 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 the column stopped. I didn't know, have no idea why it stopped, but it stopped. I didn't like that. I wanted to, we were out in the open. There were a, a couple of houses that was out in the open. And then on our left, there was a little bit of a hill with, a, with a, some woods in it. And still nothing happened. Still no one was shooting at us. But, and so we got out of our, off, off the tanks or off the half trucks and saw them milled around. And um, uh, I remember uh, one year came over and I said, I'll make a cup of coffee. So he did, with a, uh, his canteen cup, he heated up a cup of coffee, we had a cup. And he came back later and he, and he said, uh, there's a house over there, let's go down and loot the house. Because nothing was happening, we were just milling around, which is ridiculous to be out in the open, milling around. And I, and I wasn't in the mood to uh, uh, do any, uh, any, any looting, um, which I, I never had any looting, any success. Uh, so um, again, we hung around, and then um, my, uh, oh, Section leader, the sergeant, came over to me. He said, "There's another house further off to the right. Let's go see what's in that house." Now, uh, this wasn't the just I don't know why, but anyway, we we, we both went, and uh, as we were going over, a bullet went over our head, which we thought was a German's, but it might have been one of our people shooting. But I, I have to tell you this though: when we got there, uh, into the little house, nothing. There was just uh, in one room there, were, there was a bed, and there were two dead soldiers. Um, they didn't have any the German uniform they're familiar with, but they, they were both dead. One of them didn't have his, his shoes, and I could see part of his foot was shot off. The other one, um, I, th I thought, had been slipped from ear to ear. You know? And I've always thought that, you know, they were slipped from ear to ear. You know? uh, but, but later, you know, reading up on things, I, I was just wondering if uh, he might have been you know, you know, they use piano wire to string people up. Mm -hmm. so, because I don't know if you, they were Germans or some other, uh, but I, I never, I still don't know what they were killed. But that's not the story I want to uh, get to, the part I want to get to. So Grimes and I, my section leader, went back to our column, and then one year came over again, and he said, 
let's go over to that house way up front. Uh, maybe we can find something to eat there, you know. So we went up there and yeah, we, we found some uh, preserves, which we opened up and eating. And then pretty soon we, we noticed there was, the Germans began firing on the column. You know. The Germans had been there all the time. And I guess there was some sort of uh, negotiations going on, but it didn't work out for some reason or other. They began firing on the column. And they would, um, they would fire at the, uh, the tanks and keep them buttoned up. And they would fire at the half tracks where uh, my platoon was. And one year and I were just watching it, and, and we, uh, we had some binoculars. We were at the window, because they weren't shooting at us. So it was like a movie. We were just watching, watching guys getting killed and you know, the stuff coming in. And then after a while, uh, one of our tanks did open up. You know, uh, they, uh, and, and they fired up in the hill, and they, st and they stopped. I don't know what happened, but the, the firing stopped, and we went out. And again, this is the last day we saw action, and there were quite a few people in, in our, our platoon that were killed. Yeah, that, that, that's the last bit of action I saw, yeah. And that was May 4th, and officially the, the war ended May 8th, and that was a little town up in the, uh, I think they called it the German Alps, a town called Bad Tolls, T-O-L-Z. And, and, and by that time, we were up, because as high as we were, and it was beautiful, you know, the, the Alps right there, the all, the, but there was snow uh, on, on the ground. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so we were, uh, I think it was on the 5th. We started uh, to walk out thinking it was just going back into fighting again. Then we stopped by this building in Bad Tolls, turned, and, uh, turned out to be a hospital, and we were told to go in the building. Uh, I think it was a hospital and rest area for, uh, for um, the German uh, elite. You know? And we went there, they had a beautiful big Olympic-sized swimming pool, which we used. And we were there, I think, a week or so. And then we went to a small village called Konigsberg in Germany, a beautiful little village. Now, now that was in May, you know, the middle, latter half of May, May to June. Uh, the, you know, flowers were out blossoming. It was just lovely. So, you, in spite of what you'd been through, you were able to see some beauty at the yes, end. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then, I, I have to think, you you had to get back. Where did you depart from after all okay. of that? Okay, after that, we went to another little town that we, um, I thought it was occupation troops, but I think occupation troops uh, has a, a formal meaning. We were just there. And then we went to, a, a, let's see, a June. It must have been in July, early July, latter part of June, we went to a, um, a, a camp pre preparing to, a, to go to an embarkation point. It might have been called Old Gold Camp. Anyway. We wound up uh, leaving from uh, La Havre. And uh, we left La Havre on a, a, a small b ship, much smaller than the U.S., than the SS um, America. I think it was just our regiment, you know, so it wasn't many people. And how long were you at sea at that point? That, was, that took two weeks. Two weeks yeah, to uh, get home. Yeah, yeah, one week, five days, in fact, to get there and two weeks to get back. Did you come in through New York? Yes, we did. Uh -huh. What was it like coming into the harbor? That, that was that was a little bit exciting. Was it yeah. emotional for you? Not, but not terribly. But, but it should have been. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it should have been because we passed by the um, uh, Statue of Liberty, which should have been exciting. But it was so far off, you know, it, it, it didn't uh, it didn't particularly excite me. Uh, and, but uh, as our ship uh, went through the harbor, uh, you know, the, the, uh, there were. Ships that had welcome, welcome fourth division all over it, and our own ship had the, I had our own division. It had two emblems. One was a, the twelfth regiment, uh, but anyway, there, there were a number of signs saying welcome fourth division, and there were uh, ships that were firing the uh, fire hose streams up, uh, and there were people uh, cheering. And then when we got off, there was a band playing there. Uh, when we loaded in Boston, there was a band playing also, but I hardly noticed it. I just marched in. But there was a band playing. Uh, we, we took us to a, I think it was New Jersey, the camp in New Jersey. And we had, a, I know we had a steak at dinner and ice cream, first time, you know, time. That was very nice. And did you have time left after that, or were you discharged? No, no uh, I, I had a little time left. Well, see, at, at that time, I didn't realize. I thought we were home and that, that was it. But they had us. Flag to go to Japan, uh, uh, um, so we got, we got a 30-day furlough. So that took us into August, probably the middle of August. But uh, but it was before the uh, atom bombs were dropped, before the peace with Japan, 
And uh, so I did go back. I made separate trips back and forth from North, from North Carolina uh, back home. That's why went, at least some of those trips I thumbed. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, so after what you'd been through, you still were going to have to fight additionally in Japan? Yeah, I don't know if I could have done it. You know, I, I, we used to uh, just joking, we said, if we had to fight Japan, I'd jump off the boat. But I don't think I'd have. It, it would have been the same thing. I'd have wound up, you know, reluctantly going and then, uh, you know. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, when I was home on my second furlough, uh, the, the, the atomic bombs were dropped. And I remember I was walking downtown and um, downtown framing him. Framing him mm -hmm. uh, and I met a, an old friend uh, who said uh, the Russians had joined the war. He said the war won't last long now, and I kind of agreed with him. And I, of course, I didn't know what the atomic bomb was. You know, I thought it was oh, it's a big bomb. You know, uh, and sure enough, the war was over very shortly after that. Uh, so therefore, so at that time, um, I think our um, the twelfth regiment of the fourth division almost disintegrated, because uh, I, I got a, at that point, uh, I got a letter from the 12th Regiment, I believe, or the, or the division. They'd found out that I graduated from Bentley's, and they asked me to, uh, you know, to come back so I could work in the finance office or something. That would have been worth a million dollars, you know, back in combat. But at that time, I didn't want to go back, you know. I, I did go back, but I just went back to our, our company, the mm -hmm. old friends. Yeah. So once you reached stateside and you had a little bit of furlough, where were you stationed after that, or were you discharged after? Or discharged after Camp Butner, North Carolina. Yeah. And then, although we were shipped to uh, Fort Devens, uh, just as when we came in, I went to Fort Devens. What was it like for your family having you home? Well, they were ecstatic. They were very, very pleased. Could, did they have any idea what you had been through? I think so. I, th I, I think so. Did you talk much about it at all? Mm, no, very little. Mm -hmm. uh, How did you pick up your life after that, having been through such an experience? Well, you know, the first months, um, so I got discharged in uh, August, September, October, and November. I was pretty depressed. I was very depressed. You know, you'd think that it'd be elated, you know, being home. But I think one thing I missed, even though I hated the war, I missed my friends. You know, I, and all of a sudden I was alone. You know? uh, whereas uh, in the war I was never alone. I always had someone. Uh, but then in January uh, I um, enrolled at Boston University, and, and then that, that's it. I forgot about the war. Uh, and did you graduate from BU? Yes. And what was your major? Accounting. You had told us prior to going on tape about a story regarding one of your good friends and he and his son having gone to see a movie. Oh, Tell yes. us about that. Okay, that's Pat Nelges. Yeah, he, was, uh, he joined us just before um, Paris. We, we were still in, in Normandy, but just before Paris. A good friend also, Pat. Uh, Marcellus Nelges, but they called him Pat. Well, how do you spell his last name? Uh, N-I-L-G-E-S. He was young. Now, I thought he was 18. But I found, since found that he was, I guess he was 20 when he joined us. But nevertheless, he was young, nice guy. And uh, I didn't correspond with, with him, but uh, in 1951, and I, I was in business, uh, you know, uh, my work, I was, I was uh, passing through St. Louis, and uh, I, I looked his name up in the phone book and called, and uh, he and his son came out to see me. Uh, and I was very glad to see him, but I didn't have much time to spend with him. Then I was back in my plane back home. Like I guess that was, I think that was 1951. Um, and then, a month and a half ago or something, um, my son got an email from a Nelges uh, saying he was Pat Nelges' son. And uh, he was wondering if we were related. <laughs> if we were related. <clears throat> my son called me and asked me, if this was a fraud or a scam or what was it? I said, no, it's no scam, it's Pat Nelges. So I wrote back to Pat's son, I uh, emailed him back. And so we, we wrote, uh, I got a picture of Pat. His wife died about a year ago. Uh, and he's, he's did well. Did what well. prompted him to write? Uh, he and his son had been to uh, see uh, Saving Private Ryan. And on the way in the car coming back, he told his son that if there's, there's just one guy he'd like to get in contact with, it was me. Uh, so his son did. Uh, so after 40-something years, your 
reinitiating a friendship from many yes. years ago. Yeah, I, uh, he wrote, then I wrote, but I told him I was writing my memoir, I've seen it, but mm -hmm. you, and I'd send him a copy when I hadn't done, I haven't sent him yet. I'm, and in there. fact, we will say on tape that we do have a record of some very, very well-written memoirs that you have given us, oh, so fine. they will be a part of this. How important do you feel serving in the military was for you? Well, in retrospect, uh, since I survived it, I, I think it was, it was very important. Uh, I, if, if I knew I was going to survive it, uh, I would have uh, enjoyed it. But, but really, while it was going on, I just wanted to stay alive. Uh, How do you think it affected the rest of your life? Oh, there, there were, I mean, I'm sure there were, uh, it affected me quite, quite strongly. Uh, I, I don't know just how. But, Were uh, you a mature 20-year-old, or did you gain a maturity quickly, having been through the experience that you were in? My wife says I'm still not mature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, how, uh, one of the questions that we've asked a number of the veterans that we've interviewed that I'd like to ask you now, too, is how you feel about the difference of public opinion regarding the veterans of your generation in World War II versus those in the Korean conflict and those in the Vietnam War? Well, I, I think the, the difference was a difference, but, but I, I can understand it, because in World War II, everyone, virtually everyone was in the war. The, the whole country was pretty much united behind it. The Vietnam, uh, there, there were always doubts, and uh, it's a shame, but, uh, because the, 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 the boys suffered so much, which I, I know they did. Um, but it was just a different situation. So, uh, right or wrong, it was different. Yeah, uh -huh, yeah. And of course, I've got to say this. During the war, I didn't know that um, the Jewish people were, were you know, um, being killed. Or what the, what the, you know what I mean? With the, the, concentration, the concentration camps and annihilation. Well, and the, uh, yeah, well, we, saw, we liberated some concentration camps. But uh, you know, they had their striped uniforms. But I thought they were just mostly Polish. We call we call them DPs, displaced persons, and I, I really had no idea what they were. But I've never seen these emaciated people, uh, prisoners that we've seen since. So I, I just didn't know uh, extermination is the word I was thinking of. I didn't know anything about extermination camps. I might have felt differently, you know, uh, more gung ho, if I'd known about those. Mm -hmm. Although I still think when it comes to artillery and, and uh, people want to live, you want to live your own life, you, you know. Is there one thought or one comment that you would leave us with this afternoon? It can not only be for your family, but also for others who might share in viewing this tape in the future? No, honestly, I, I, I don't have anything. <laughs> I don't have any thoughts. You've had a remarkable story to tell us today. I'd like to thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much.